So we are at quorum. Okay, right. I'll start recording. Did you want to go, Dan? Oh, yeah, I wasn't sure that it had gotten going. Um, all right, uh, hola y bienvenidos, everyone. Welcome to the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Everyone is welcome to attend this call and participate, so long as you abide by the antitrust policy and our community code of conduct. Um, we've got a fairly action-packed agenda for today. Uh, kick right into things with the project life cycle task force uh, at the end of or during last week's call what we discussed doing was uh, getting ready to vote on uh, the four least contentious um, or the four most completed resolutions and uh, one of those we ended up having a little bit more dialogue on and one of them was uh, referred to the marketing committee uh, which leaves us with a couple of issues. So I'll turn things over to our no here to uh, describe things further, and then we can uh, <clears throat> at least vote on those two. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, so the first one is actually fairly straightforward, I believe. Uh, issue four was about this notion of, you know, can you move a project back onto the into the life cycle uh, on to the life cycle pro path, and um, there wasn't actually much controversy over that. I actually suggested we move back in certain, certain conditions, but the vast majority of people who expressed themselves in the task force said no. And so the proposed resolution is that a project never goes back and it can stay as long as it wants in incubation or active status. Because that was one of the key questions, right? It's like, well, you have a project that's in incubation, it seems to never manage to qualify, graduate to graduate to active status. Should it go back to something like a lab or something? And or if it's in active status, but you know, can it go back under certain circumstances? So the proposed resolution again is that we state clearly that no, they can stay there as long as they want. The, that means the only way if things really derailed or they are kind of abandoned, there is another path which is to move forward towards deprecation and eventually end of life. But it's a one-way street. I guess my only question with this is if you have an active uh, project that becomes, I guess, like uncompliant, uh, like so for instance, like Dan had mentioned uh, lower, I think on like the CII and that sort of thing, what, yep. what would that entail? Like it's still act, it's still active in terms of there's contributors, but it's uh, maybe uncompliant for some reason. I think we would have to take that up in the TSC and try to work with the maintainers to make it compliant. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's a, another resolution that, that somebody could put forward with what do we do with a, a bad acting project, but um, I'm willing to cross that bridge when we come to it. And I mean, yeah, so, and, you know, hopefully in, a res in a such a case, we would find some kind of, you know, uh, amicable resolution. Otherwise, you essentially kick them out by saying, okay, we are going to move you to end of life and get, we mm -hmm. shut down the project. There isn't much, you know, other way to deal with that if that really can to this if you cannot talk with them and find some reasonable compromise that is we find acceptable then that's the only outcome possible okay so uh i move that we take a vote on this i uh, seconded all right let's do this uh viva voce so we'll just do um all in favor and then you say uh, everybody says that in unison, more or less, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, all in favor? All yeah. in favor. Aye. 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 That was anything but in sync. Uh, but <laughs> actually helps when they're slightly offset. Kind of get a rock. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Opposed? All right. Not hearing any opposition. Uh, any abstentions? 
All right, issue number four, or resolution four, uh, passes uh, with unanimous voice vote onto issue five and resolution five. Yeah, <clears throat> so there was also this discussion about the beginning of uh, a project. I mean, so far, yeah, obviously, we started with the HIP process to start a project. So you submit a proposal to the TSC, and then if it's approved, you start an incubation. But we also introduced the labs, and uh, this makes it easier to start projects with that much uh, TSC oversight. And so the question came up at some point whether you know we should kind of push everything to labs as a first step. And uh, again, I think in the in the end the discussion was pretty short in the task force. People said no, we shouldn't do that. There are plenty of cases where it wouldn't make sense; it'd be odd. And so we should keep things as is. So the proposal is that no, not all projects should be required to start as a lab. And um, on the other end, it does provide for the case where the TSC might still, in its deliberation, you know, uh, uh, about a proposal, might say, you know what, we don't think this is ready for a project, but feel free to go create a lab. So that's what the proposal basically says. Okay. All right. Well, I move for a vote on resolution five. I second it. All right. Again, uh, by voice, all in favor? All in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? All right. Passes by unanimous voice. So issue seven uh, is off to marketing for their feedback, but it is otherwise uh, complete from the committee's perspective. Is that right, Arno? Yes, that's correct. And I mean, basically it's kind of trying to endorse what has happened to date, we believe is, you know, regarding the, the how names gets, uh, how project gets name, right? So we can talk about that hopefully next week, or well, the, the week after. Mm -hmm. All right, and this is the one that uh, we wanted some discussion on during this meeting, and we'll, um, I think we have enough time to, for, for a reasonable amount of dialogue here before we go into uh, yes. the DI. So that's right, so this is issue eight. So the issue eight is about how we deal with new projects that are coming that would be, you know, basically with that as a, a pretty <laughs> uh, strong history where you might have the case where there's actually a company that has even shipping products, and now they are coming to Hyperledger and say, hey, let's start a project. We're happy to contribute all our code. And there was the question, well, how do we deal with this, right? So, um, the, you know, based on, there was quite a bit of discussion about that one. In the end, I thought, you know, what captured the, the seemed to capture uh, what people were thinking of, a way to do it would be, because so, you don't want to give them a pass and get, you know, blow up all the, the normal safeguards we have built in into, you know, the incubation process with the exit criteria. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, you have to acknowledge that, well, they may be able to, um, to be far along what you would expect from a normal project which starts from scratch. So the proposal that's actually drafted basically says, hey, people are free to, you know, if you happen to believe that your project already meet the execute area for incubation, you're free to submit a proposal to graduate or request to graduate to active status at the same time, essentially, as you make a heap. And I thought that, that the advantage of making sure, you know, basically they go through the process faster, but they still have to meet all the criteria that are required of any project. And then, um, but Dan pointed out, I don't think it's possible because you wouldn't be able to meet the criteria on day one because part of the exit criteria is actually to be, you know, part of the Hyperledger community. 
and you wouldn't be able to have done all of that on day one. And I think it's a, it's a valid point. So I'm kind of like, you know, um, changing my mind on the proposal, but when I looked, so it led me to look very carefully at the executoria for incubation. And the problem is the way it's written, you could argue, no, I can meet those criteria because we say, well, you should have created a repo for instance, but we don't say, well, it should be a hyperledger repo. <laughs> so depending on which filter you use when you read the executoria, you know, you might argue, well, I, I don't, it doesn't have to be within Hyperledger and I can already meet this criteria. And so, you know, I think it's a bit of a stretch. My, 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 my position is, well, you know, the executoria need to be read within the context of Hyperledger. So when we say, for instance, you must have a repo, you must have a CI set up with tests, all this stuff, it is implied that all of this has to be within Hyperledger, which makes it impossible indeed to have to meet those criteria at the same time as you just start the project, even though you may have a long history outside of Hyperledger where you have a CI and where you have a repo and all of that. But I thought it was an interesting kind of fact and I wanted to bounce it with everybody here. Thought, you know, do people agree on this? basic principle that the executor you have to be read within the context of hyperledger and when we say you must have a repo it is a hyperledger repo so i very much agree that the conditions need to be met as a hyperledger project when a project moves from being hosted in one place to another the community doesn't always move with it and so it, it makes sense that you know you may have met these criteria before but moving to hyperledger might have been um, for a, a reason that we don't know about, like maybe the community has been struggling or maybe the company that was sponsoring it has gone away. And so that, that means some of the contributors and maintainers may have also gone away. And so ha seeing it in that light makes a lot of sense. All right, thank you. Anybody else? I think Nathan put it really well. Okay, so that that's, seems we're of convergence of thought there. And uh, so I will revise this proposal uh, accordingly, and then next time we pray we should, we should be able to close it. Great. Um, I, for one, am liking this process of having some uh, well-worded uh, issues and resolutions put forth that we can uh, go through this format on, on the wiki with and get some good offline conversation. Thanks. Yep, I agree. All right. Um, navigate back from that to the uh, agenda here. Um, so the next thing is we've had the, the CICD task force in flight for some time. And I think we got uh, a note out late last night or early this morning, I guess in the time zone. Yeah. And so uh, I haven't had a chance to review it in detail. I did get to uh, skim it a little bit. I'm not sure where others are, but uh, Dave, if you'd like to walk us through some, uh, some version of that. Sure. Yeah, I can just hit the key points without um, going through the whole report. This was just a quick uh, wrap up based on all of my notes that I had in front of me at the time. Apologize for the the you know not giving you guys more time to read it, but um, the upside of that is you know we're not actually ready to make a full proposal to the TSC and and have votes on it because there's still some outstanding investigation being done by the Fabric team. However, the key points here are that. Like I said last week, um, this, is, this is basically a Sisyphean task. Um, the problems are that no two projects are alike in their needs for CI. Um, and because we haven't required all projects to um, get over onto the existing Jenkins and Garrett uh, CI system, um, 
a lot of teams have gone off and built their own. So uh, trying to find one CI system that solves everybody's problems is basically impossible. Um, so to eat this elephant, we decided to uh, look at short-term solutions versus long-term solutions. Um, we listened to a lot of the team's pain points, and there are some short-term solutions that we're considering doing right now. Um, but we're not exactly in the right place to to pull the trigger on it. <laughs> we're still trying to figure out what to do um, in the short term. The Fabric team is investigating Circle CI, and um, we've talked to Sawtooth and Roja. I've talked to Indy. Um, about their needs and basically the short-term solution ideas are well let me put it this way so the goals that we were trying to achieve that's probably the best way to start here was to get all of the teams together onto some kind of CI system that the Hyperledger CA staff has visibility into we wanted to collect metrics um, I have a number of security checks, automated checks and stuff that I'd like to put in there in place. Um, and we also wanted to try to use Hyperledger resources to try to reduce the burden on the existing um, corporate run um, CI pipelines. So initially we wanted to, to look at trying to get everybody onto a single CI pipeline. And that's where we got to the point where everything like that, that seems to be somewhat impossible um, without some degree of pain, I should say. Uh, so the short-term solutions were things like maybe we can um, start reimbursing money-wise for um, the existing CI systems to kind of release, reduce the, the resource burden, the money burden. Um, another idea was take the existing system of Jenkins and start running minions over on AWS to speed all of that stuff up. Um, and another solution was maybe C Circle CI, we, or like GitLab or something, we bless that as the, um, the one CI system that all Hyperledger uses and we slowly start migrating everybody over. Um, like I said, there's a lot of trade-offs here. The long-term solutions that we were looking at were doing Kubernetes clusters so everybody could just lift and shift their existing CI pipelines over onto a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there are some technical reasons for why we can't do that. Um, again, some of the needs for some of the projects require having like bare metal VMs rather than um, containers. So that is, you know, again, not a perfect solution, but definitely one we could consider. Um, there were some concerns about being able to scale this up in the future. Um, right took a lot of initiative on uh, working out the exact uh, IT requirements and money that we would have to put at this to have a unified CI system for all projects. Turns out the budget would have to significantly increase if Hyperledger was going to pay for all the resources for all the teams to jump onto a CI system. And by significantly increase, we were thinking not 20%, but like 200%. Um, we don't know the exact number, but that's just the rough scale of how it would have to increase. So, um, Dave, I, I wait, would like to have the the two hundred percent figure. You don't have to do it live here, but um, I, I don't think it hurts to put all options on the table for the board. Right. Um, I'm going. So this is just a draft, and I was going to go um, get rise numbers and and put more stuff into this. So the board report has a lot more detail. This is just for the TSC, and it was just a summary. Um, but the the full report is going to contain all of the numbers and and much more detail on each of the teams. So, um, are, are are you saying that the there is no sort of open source freemium capability to engage or you know have we have we had any negotiations at all with these companies yeah we have been talking to circle ci and um there was no open source freemium kind of thing like the we were already talking about budgeting some money to support moving over to ci cd or, or sorry to circle ci mm -hmm. to see what that would cost and uh -huh. it's it's significant it's not a normal savings we're still trying to work out what exactly they're per user 
licensing term means in the term in the context of an open source project. I, so, like I said, there's some ongoing investigation about some lingering details. I think it's also kind of too early to even set guidance like like you know that the budget has to double. I mean, um, we're still trying to figure out if the quote we got from Circle CI is for a, a, a number of users that would that would have to grow linearly as we add projects or for unlimited. Um, just in the way they define users is is <clears throat> just a little hard to uh, understand, but we're working on that. But also, you know, GitLab CI and 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 Azure pipelines and some other things are still viable candidates, and we don't even have yes. pricing yet. So, so I don't it, it, don't set any expectations right now. I think about you know budget being being different. I mean, I, there's still a lot more research to do on that. To figure out if it's more or if it's less. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, we just know that if we were to try to pay for them all, we're, we're trying to figure out how to do it cheaper. And um, there is no obvious like, ha ha, we can save a whole bunch of money here, right? Um, the Circle CI one is really interesting because that one makes it very easy for community contributed hardware to join into clusters. So if uh, teams had people with spare hardware under their desk or whatever, they could put those all together. Um, Mike Lauder and I ran an experiment for the Ursa team I have a spare server under my under my desk and within a few minutes, I think like less than five minutes, I was able to spin it up and um, run a virtual machine on it and join the Ursa build cluster. And it immediately started doing Ursa builds. So that aspect of it was really exciting. However, you know, relying heavily on community source resources like that is also has its problems, right? Reliability and being able to bring to bear enough resources to actually make a, a real impact. So, um, I, I guess the, the the important thing for the te the TSC at this moment is that we looked at all options and there are no good ones. And this report is going to be fleshed out here over the next day or two once I um, get all of my notes dumped into here. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to update the TSC that you know. The reason this has been slow coming is because there's no obvious answers and we're trying to eat an elephant. Um, the one thing I might want to get some feedback from you from the TSC members was is that we are thinking that if we wanted to meet our requirements for doing metrics and security and transparency that in the long term we should probably look towards getting everybody onto one CI system. Um, not only does that create like a tacit community knowledge about our CI system, so any new projects coming in would be able to talk to just about anybody in Hyperledger and, and you know, get help on getting over to our CI system. Um, but it would also unify all of our tools and we'd be able to do better integration and, and um, all of that, right? However, moving everybody to a single CI system would be exceedingly painful from an engineering and time standpoint. So that that's where I'm gonna leave it off. If you guys got any more questions, um, I'll be you know pinging the TSC mailing list as I put more detail in here. I, I just have one question and I apologize, you know, maybe I should know that, but I mean, this got not to be a very specific question to Hyperledger. How do all the projects within the Linux Foundation do with that? Um, so it depends on where you're where you're at in the Linux Foundation. Um, obviously, the if you're talking about the kernel project and the Git project, they actually have um, external resources that um, run against that project, but the project itself doesn't manage them. So, which is really interesting. I talked to Constantine, who um, coordinates a lot of the infrastructure for the kernel project, and there's actually external companies that run the the kernel tree against a CI test battery and things like that. And the kernel project doesn't even run one, okay. um, which is interesting. I thought that was very, very interesting. They were just like, you know what? We're not going to do it. <laughs> um, all their developers are constantly building. Um, so I don't know. They, they didn't see the need for it, I guess. Um, uh, as I understand it, CNCF has, the CI pipelines that were set up for Kubernetes before it came over. So I think they just adopted that as their standard and, and I don't think they force all of their projects to do it, but they make it available. So there's, that's sort of a middle road. It's like, yes, we have one. If you want to use it, this is what you use, but you don't have to. 
Uh, and, and talking to Chris Anachek there, they uh, um, have had a negative experience with Circle CI and a positive experience with Azure pipelines. Yeah. Um, so, so no, we, there's, yeah, we've reached out. It's, it's, there's not a consistent um, kind of repeating kind of clear answer on this either. Everyone kind of, you know, figures their own way out through this, but we, we are trying to, to learn from other projects. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, like I said, the, the long-term recommendation, I think, for Hyperledger, because we do have such strong security and, and metrics um, initiatives, would be to head towards one CI system for everybody. Now, whether we force all teams to use it or not, that would be a TSC decision. Whether we do a single blessed CI system would be also a TSC uh, decision. Um, if that's where we think we're going to head, then Ray and I will have to do a lot of um, financial resources analysis. You know, what would it take to get all the teams over onto this one that we're thinking about? And what are our options for scaling and, and saving money in the long term? So um, I would appreciate any of the TSC members to you know, reach out to me if you've got questions or, or any suggestions. Um, yeah, so I, and we're gonna, I'm probably going to take this discussion to the TSC list um, and get it out of the meeting here when, as all the details go in and, and we discuss this. So keep an eye there. Yeah, and I, I hope you're getting good participation in the, the committee itself. Um, I think that the way that, that some meetings go is when, when nobody speaks up, then whatever whatever, uh, who, whoever has spoken up ends up being maybe uh, disproportionately influential, uh, but that is only, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with, with that louder voice. But if, if you don't speak up and you don't offer your suggestion, then you can't hope uh, that the conclusion is gonna be what, what you have in your head. So I really yeah. hope we are getting good participation there. Thanks for pointing that out, Dan. I did want to thank the community for their engagement on this. We did um, get feedback from all of the teams that have existing CI pipelines. Um, we've had consistent attendance from the Fabric team and the Sawtooth team. Um, I've been able to get good interaction with the Aroha team over email um, because we're, they were kind of time zoned out. Um, and the Ursa team always made themselves available. So. Or Ursa, you know, in the Aries teams were always made themselves available. So um, this was one of the, the cases where getting participation was not hard. Everybody has their own opinions about CI, which also makes it difficult. So um, yeah, thank you guys for, for engaging and, and participating. Um, and, and think if there is a model not unlike what Arno has done with, uh, um, uh, with the, the, the project life cycle task force that as you have some options on the project life cycle right as you as you have a proposal coming together or maybe some some alternative proposals if you could put those up as individual pages and then that gives people something concrete to support or um, suggest changes to yeah that, that's actually a really good idea I, I like how Arno did that um, we have these options. We have questions we want to bring to the TSC, but I want to loop back with Rye first before we do it. And, you know, um, the member summit's coming up too. So it would be really nice to talk to people uh, face to face. So I was just trying to get this report together for the board of like, here's everything we know about this um, so that the board can discuss it. But um, I don't know that we're going to be able to make any decisions um, at the TSC here before the board meeting. And, and well, that's so, but I, oh. I do think that we should be weighing in from the projects, certainly. I mean, you know, it, it, the, certainly budget and everything is one aspect, and that needs board approval, understood completely. But we shouldn't be choosing a solution that the projects don't want or are uncomfortable with. And so I think there needs to be a staged approval process where the projects are saying, hey, verily, this works for us. And then that gets ratified by the board. 
Yes. As opposed um, to the other way around where the board makes a decision and then the projects are like, what the hell? Yeah, I think the intent was that the proposal would come up to the TSC and it would have had the input of the projects and then we would bless it and recommend right. that to the board for new funding. Right. right. No, I, and, and, you know, there's many projects represented on the TSC, but I do think we also want to make sure that, in fact, all of the projects have had an opportunity to weigh in if we're going to go with uh, one CI to rule them all. Yes, that's and I, true. And I, and I that's suspect true. rather than it being like, you, you know, like, like this cliff where there's like this decision made and imposed on everyone else that what we'll, we'll do is <laughs> like, you know, the short term uh, fix, which is, you know, fix this for the current Jenkins kind of pipeline, you know, we'll get that, we'll, we'll make a decision there, get it adopted, uh, keep an eye out for making sure this is priced and configured so that other projects can pick it up as well. And, and and that we can start to get closer and closer to an ideal solution. And yeah. it may be the case that there's still one of the our 14 projects that decide that it's it's not what they want and they want they're happy to do their own CI and that we might decide that's fine. Um, you know, I I, I but, uh, but you know we'll continue to do the kind of long term research on on other candidates even as we solve the short term problems. And those two solutions may converge at the same point. Um, they may differ. I think that's fine. Uh, and to your point, uh, Chris, the teams, some teams including well, specifically the fabric team is already investigating um, potential alternatives to what they have now. I think they're, they're playing. No, I, I, CI we right had now. a right. And in Brian's yeah. note, he linked to the presentation we had yesterday and there seemed to be, you know, again, broad agreement that we could move off of Garrett. And so, <coughs> but um uh, conversely, you know, the other part of this is we can't let this drag on forever and ever um, for a variety of reasons that, you know, but, um, uh, you know, ideally we get a resolution fairly quickly um, uh, because uh, I think the fabric team would like to do this before 2.0, which is the end of September, October-ish time frame. Um, so that we can then have a, you know, a consistent approach going forward. Um, yeah, in fact, a question I had asked in my email was, um, to what degree does the PSU need to approve um, fixing what's currently broken, you know, um, uh, kind of the Jenkins plus Garrett uh, kind of combo, you know, uh, or once once the group of people involved and affected kind of decide, okay, here's, here's the answer to the short-term thing, can we pull the trigger on? Yeah, signing a contract and and moving over that sort of thing, you know, um, or even even such smaller details as, you know, before making a decision about CI/CD, can the fabric team move from Garrett to GitHub? Um, you know, those kinds of things probably could be um, delegated out or or handled without without waiting for you know um, a master proposal to come in. Yeah, out. moving off of well, yeah, but uh, I don't think it's it's necessarily that simple because then moving from Garrett to GitHub would mean re-implementing a bunch of webhooks and stuff like that to trigger off the existing Jenkins pipeline. Um, I'd rather think we would want to do that in one swell foop as opposed to having to do it twice. If you understand okay. me. So, so th that decision combined with, you know, a move say to circle CI or Azure pipeline, um, that decision could be separated out from the, um, you know, solve the 90 percentile, you know, CI CD problem mm -hmm. for the whole yeah. of the project. Just trying to be iterative about it, remove blockers, try to get progress made. Mm -hmm. uh, it's helpful, like with all the, the working groups and committees to have the minutes there to walk through. Um, uh, so to keep those things valuable, uh, this applies to all the committees and working groups. We try to make sure that the those minutes are actually um, capturing the, the useful bits of the message and are accurately reflecting attendance. Yep. Kind of thumbing through those, it looks like maybe that attendee list is probably cut and pasted from, from one of the original meetings. Yeah, yeah, it is. I had heard that actually there's some of the other projects sort of drifted away. Um, 
And I don't understand if that's because they don't like where the direction was or they don't care. I honestly don't know. Well, um, I mean, to be honest, some of the teams were like, we like what we have. If you're going to make us move, we're not going to. That was some of the initial feedback <clears throat> at the beginning. And I'm not going to name names, but it was not just one project. It was multiple projects. And so we tried to lure them back into the conversation with the carrot of, well, Hyper Ledger does have resources for this, and this could help defray some of the costs that you're already incurring. And that got them to the table at least, but you know, it largely the uniform response from all the teams was, we're good, thanks, <laughs> right? Like nobody wanted to change that was pretty much the only universal agreement here. And I had to convince them and Rye did a, you know, a lot of work here behind the scenes, trying to get people convinced that, you know, on one hand, we talk, we start talking about all these metrics we want to collect about contrib contributions and having automated systems around who gets to participate in the TSC elections and what our community looks like and all this stuff. We have these directives from the TSC that we need to collect all this stuff one of the best ways to do that is through the CI system, you know, and the automated like merging of, of patches and then building them and all that kind of stuff. We can collect statistics through that system. And then I have a bunch of directives about doing ongoing continuous security checks for the, the, the continuous delivery aspect of this. And it would be nice to someday be able to issue a verifiable credential or verifiable proof that says no known, you know, security vulnerabilities in the software or its dependencies are known at this time, right? And, and make that an active signal that users of our software can test or verify. Um, and it would be an automatic signal to them if we ever found something like that. I mean, there's some really cool capabilities we could do through the dog fooding process if we were all onto a single CI system. Um, but those are a long term, you know, down the road. They're not something you face tomorrow. And a lot of the teams were very skeptical. So it was a very difficult task force to move forward. And um, the participation was piecemeal. It wasn't like everybody showed up in the same room at the same time. We were constantly chasing down teams and asking questions and trying to get uh, participation. However, they did make themselves available even when they didn't want to. And that's what my thank, thank you to the community was earlier. I did appreciate not just completely ignoring us. <laughs> So it's, it's a difficult task that we were given. There's no easy solutions. It's an ongoing discussion, like Brian said. And um, I, I guess the, the thing we should do here is figure out what we can approve from the TSC and the mailing list this week ahead of the board meeting um, so that if there's any budget changes, we can, we can take those to the board um, next week. So that's it for the discussion here, though. I don't really have anything else to discuss no, there's, unless there's more questions. And there's not going to be a change in the budget between in this next week. That's so, correct. It would be more of an advisory of this is what we're thinking about. Kind of, no, right, it, right. It, yeah, we're still we're still way early for that. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I misspoke. Okay. Well, thanks for the updates, and uh, I hope uh, everybody can can take a look through. Uh, the stuff that was emailed and, and is now linked on the, the committee page in greater detail offline. Uh, and hope we can get some proposals up onto that committee page that people can react to in, in their own time zones. And we can move things forward. All right, the, uh, the last thing that we have on the agenda for today is to start to talk about the project pipeline. And, and I'll get that uh, underway, and then we can get a little bit of discussion going there. So our uh, sort of unofficial policy all along has been that the, the bar sort of goes up continuously as the ecosystem matures, as the Hyperledger projects themselves mature, uh, so that we're always trying to get uh, new capabilities into Hyperledger and not necessarily get redundant uh, redundant projects. We've in the past had redundant projects at some level of abstraction, but that's that's usually been because we have unique capabilities uh, at the lower levels of those projects. 
and we wanted a, a degree of experimentation that can take place in the marketplace by by letting these different projects grow and thrive on their own merits. Uh, so as we will continue to get new projects, it's beneficial if we can give a little bit more direction to the, the broader community about what kind of things we're looking for at Hyperledger and what shape those things should take on. What we've been talking about a lot this year is componentization or convergence. And our, our good accomplishments uh, since fall of last year are bringing on uh, Ursa and Transact to start to look at things that are, are common across the projects and, and make things that are more like libraries that the frameworks can consume with with maybe a, a more distant vision that there's sort of a cohesive hyperledger that people will build applications against uh, as opposed to um, more proliferation of silos where there's fairly independent offerings from from hyperledger under the original umbrella notion uh, want to get some more dialogue going on that uh, probably on the email list uh, of course uh, but also getting some of that back and forth here while we've got people's time so like to hand things over to Chris uh, uh, to kind of continue the discussion at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, um, it, you know, my, my perspective has has been that um, you know, just adding top level DLT projects in particular. Um, is sort of counterproductive to um, draw, driving towards the consolidation that Dan talked about. Um, you know, we, we set up, you know, the architecture working group and various other working groups to try and drive, you know, aligned thinking around some of these topics to get a better understanding of, you know, um, you know, what these things should look like and uh, and yet, you know, after, you know, three years now, we still have sort of, you have what, five top level DLTs. If you incorporate, you know, if you include uh, Indy, uh, Plenum as a fully fledged DLT and, and not a lot of alignment, you know, a little bit with, you know, Burrow, EVM getting baked into Ceph and Fabric. Um, I think that was a good start and it gave me a lot of uh, hope, you know, that, you know, we could start driving towards alignment. I think Transact is, uh, you know, uh, and, and Ursa are also sort of moving in that direction where we're thinking about as a community, how do we drive alignment around, you know, what's, what's a smart contract engine interface look like? And can we incorporate the same thing into, um, the DLTs and then start thinking about, okay, so maybe we specialize on, you know, whether a DLT is, uh, you know, order execute or execute order validate or, you know, uh, or, or whether there's, you know, different forms of consensus plugins um, uh, or whether they're oriented a little bit more towards, you know, IOT or to, you know, this flavor of use case and that flavor, I, you know, but, Again, starting to drive towards a model where you know we have a bunch of pluggable components that you can build your Millennial Falcon, or you can build your uh, uh, Millennium Falcon, rather, or you can build your. I was going to uh, call you on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are here. You're 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 at at right. Um, depending on what you need, right? Um, as opposed to should I use this one or that one or that one, and and then you know, sort of having the projects pitted against one another as in some sort of a, you know, bake off, which I think is counterproductive. And, you know, when we had the conversations at the, um, uh, at the hack fest in, uh, where were we? <laughs> I can't remember. I think we were in, I think, 
no, I don't remember where, where the hell we were. It doesn't matter. Um, Amsterdam, I think maybe. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, should we, you know, have, you know, sort of differentiating things about each product, uh, project and, you know, basically the, well, certainly the sawtooth and the fabric teams were sort of completely against the idea of trying to sort of say, you know, which one is better for that or the other thing, because it, they're very similar, right? And, you know, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's unhelpful if we're competing against each other. It doesn't lend itself to, uh, you know, trying to drive towards much more of a cohesive and collaborative community that's, you know, exploring innovation together as opposed to trying to compete with one another for, um, uh, you know, for eyeballs. So uh, adding, you know, more projects to the, to the top level doesn't excite me. Adding more transacts and URSAs and, you know, raft plugins and stuff like that, that's, you know, built on a common framework that, uh, that excites me. That gets me a lot more. Uh, it, 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 it gives me a lot more hope for Hyperledger generally if we're kind of aligned in our thinking about some of these things. It doesn't mean that we can't have an identity flavored thing and a you know, supply chain flavored thing and a you know, finance or token flavored thing, <clears throat> but uh, you know, hopefully built from a lot of the same componentry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. I wanted to put um, Ben on the spot next. Uh, ben, uh, I think you communicated in the past that you know we need new functionality, or at least the entirety of the Hyperledger feature offerings uh, isn't yet complete. Uh, so I wonder if you've got some thoughts about that to share. Okay, so I don't. Uh... I guess I I didn't expect this to have the floor. <laughs> so I'm going to say whatever on my mind. Um, um, and in the past couple of years, um, I've been trying to uh, to build a very sophisticated, you know, enterprise grade application on top of blockchain. And you know, as part of the company, uh, we certainly uh, and not tie into any kind of implementation. So we certainly evaluated uh, different different frameworks, if you will, or different implementations of blockchain. Um, and and certainly we we pick one to to go, and and, and we we pick fabric for for a number of reasons because you know I was part of it, uh, or I am still part of it. Um, but uh, the, 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 even with that, there's still lack of, you know, key, basic key functionalities that are needed for an enterprise application. Um, and and not, not just Fabric, uh, all of the frameworks out there. So because of that, I, I have to keep my mind open because this is a very, we are still very early in the development of uh, blockchain or of DLT. Um, I'm looking at the history of the database. You know, it's been like 40, 50 years now, but new databases still come out. You know, back in the 90s, we never heard of the databases that people are using today. Um, so, you know, why would we say that we are at the plateau now that the frameworks existing today are going to be the framework and we need to focus on less number of frameworks but more on collaboration. Um, that, that's, that's one side of it. The, the other side of the coin is that, you know, I feel like um, competition is really good thing for the community. Uh, you know, certainly it can bring up, it can, competition certainly can, can bring about you know, some other things and undesirable things, but if we manage it carefully, internal competition is always good because competition is what drives the next evolution or the next revolution um, in whatever we do. 
So because of that, I want to keep an open mind. Um, what, what, what Chris said and you know, what we've been set forward to do, uh, I in general agree with that, that it's more collaboration is better, but that doesn't mean that we shut down you know, on accepting new things into the community to enable that next wave of motivation that because of that, people might think about something else different and because of think, be able to think about something else different, it would take us to the next level that we might call it evolution or revolution, depending on the technology that we encounter at that point or we be able to create at that point. So, you know, I, I wouldn't at this point, in my mind, I, I wouldn't uh, sit back and, and say, you know, we, uh, we, we have enough here and, you know, we need to think about collaboration rather than competition at this point. Um, because it's just too early. Um, you know, whatever we have out there, I'm, I'm very sure it's not going to exist in, in, in the short future because new things are going to replace whatever we have today. You know, the same as any other technologies that we have seen over and over again in the last, you know, four or five decades, uh, new things are going to come and replace whatever we have. And because of that, we have to ask the community to be able to, to, to be vital, to be, to be active, uh, we have to bring new stuff in. Okay, great. And I, I think, uh, thanks for that, Ben. I think those are uh, two, two good forays into the, the beginning of the conversation here that we can pick up on uh, mail and so forth as we move forward. We have a few minutes left that we can uh, call for any questions on the identity working group uh, update. And I suspect we'll have to hit the fabric report next time. Uh, but first off, are there any questions on the identity uh, quarterly report? Okay, not hearing anything. Maybe we can actually quickly hit the uh, fabric uh, quarterly report as well. was able to review the identity one, but I don't think I've gotten to this one yet myself. Any uh, questions from the, the TSC on this? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, there's not a lot um, sort of new from, from the past, although again, you know, we, we did do 1.4.2, release that last week. Um, that includes the migration from Kafka to Raft. Um, uh, as the sort of the major new functionality. Um, the diversity has um, increased uh, a little bit more than the last time. Uh, we have, uh, I think we're plus 3% uh, or minus 3% if you, depending on how you want to look at it. But IBM is at like 36% now. Um, and uh, uh, we still, we want to grow. Um, you know, we're looking at various things with um, Salona and team on, on how we can improve, you know, diversity, how we can grow our committers uh, and uh, contributors rather, and how we grow our maintainers. Um, had open uh, invitations to a few people, you know, to step up and do some reviews, but that hasn't happened. So, but okay. uh, uh, yeah, it's basically. <laughs> we're, we're chugging along and things are improving, just not maybe as fast as I might like them. Next quarter been... kind of thing, end of the year kind of thing. Sorry? The the 2.0, is that a this quarter, next quarter, end of year kind of thing? With time so uh, we had been planning to do, so we have released a 2.0 alpha um, and uh, now that we've finished the 1.4.2 work to get the migration to Kafka, from Kafka to Raft, uh, focus now shifts back to 2.0. Um, the, the major new functionality there is the, um, the, the revised sort of chain code lifecycle. Um, uh, but we also want to get in sort of the, the validation pipeline refactor um, uh, because that enables things like tokens and you know, post-order execution, things like that. 
that I know people are interested in. Uh, the question becomes, what, what do we call 2.0? There's going to be some things that will be ready in the fall, and maybe we can do 2.0 there, or maybe we wait until the end of the year and try and get a couple more things in to make it a little bit more distinct from 1.4.2. But uh, that conversation is going to be happening over the next couple of weeks is uh, based on what we talked about yesterday. Okay, great. <clears throat> I think that brings us to the end of the time. So uh, if anybody has additional questions, I think you all know how to find uh, Chris and the other uh, fabric maintainers on chat and email. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for your time. And we will uh, talk again, uh, not next week, but... All right. Ciao. 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 Thanks, everyone.